Greetings and welcome to an LGR camera thing. And this is the Mitsubishi DJ1000 digital still camera costing 249 US dollars when it launched in the latter half of 1997. And yep, that is the same Mitsubishi that you may know for their cars and trucks, although it's not from the same division. Mitsubishi Electric was and is a massive company with dozens of branches, subdivisions, and business units. And of course, one of those divisions made digital cameras in the 90s, but it seems it was short-lived. The DJ-1000, or DJ-1 as it was sometimes called, was Mitsubishi's one and only consumer digital camera, one of the most unique of its kind in 1997. It was by far the smallest and lightest weight digital camera in the world when it was announced at PC Expo 97 in New York, weighing in at just 2.8 ounces or 80 grams. But it also didn't receive widespread distribution, initially sold exclusively through T-Zone stores in the US, of which there were only two when the DJ-1000 hit the market. It also saw distribution in Mitsubishi's home country of Japan, as you'd expect, and in Europe under the UMAX brand, where it was known as the UMAX Photo Run. But yeah, these days you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that remembers the DJ-1000 at all, much less owned one, so I was more than happy to find this one new, complete in box. Inside is a neatly packed plastic bag full of goodies, a cardboard tray with memory card stuff, and finally the camera encased in bubble wrap. And man, I knew this thing was going to be small, but wow, it's really small. It's about the size of a deck of cards, able to fit happily inside a shirt pocket. Compare this to the most popular digital camera of 1997, the Sony FD Mavica, and the difference in size and weight is ridiculous. Granted, the Mavica used 3.5-inch floppy disks, so maybe comparing it to something like the Fuji DS7 is more appropriate. But still, even against that, the DJ-1000 remains minuscule, which is extra impressive considering the Fuji uses smart media cards and the Mitsubishi uses compact flash. Yeah, that's right, the thinnest camera on the market used the thickest memory card format on the market. Go figure. It came with this 2 megabyte memory card in the box, easily the lowest capacity CF card I've ever seen. Now, this version of the package also came with this PCM CIA card adapter, ideal for laptop users, though from what I've read, Mitsubishi also offered a desktop package with another adapter. As for the bag of goodies, you get the photo retrieval software for both Windows 3.1 and 95 in English and Japanese, a very blue soft cover carrying case that holds the camera quite snugly, a wrist strap that attaches to the right hand side of the camera, and several bits of documentation in both English and Japanese. I especially dig this instruction booklet with its automobile service manual aesthetic and a message saying that it is important to you. Although of all the cameras I've covered, this is the ultimate in terms of simplicity, so almost all of this information pertains to using the DJ-1000 software for Windows, and well, looking at the camera, you can see why. There's almost nothing going on here. You just turn it on, point, and shoot. That's it. No settings to set, no adjustments to adjust, nothing but a power switch and a shutter button. There's not even a flash on the front, only a pass-through window for the viewfinder, and its tiny camera lens. A 5.8mm fixed focus lens with an aperture of 2.8 and an auto shutter speed ranging from 1 60th to 1 15,000th of a second. On top is the shutter button and the power switch, and along the bottom is where you insert the memory card. There is no tripod mount. And then there's the back of the camera which is covered in a surprising amount of text. Guess they didn't have anywhere else to put this stuff, so why not, because there's not much going on back here. Just the viewfinder, a spot to install two AAA batteries, and this pair of LEDs. Since there's no LCD screen and no sound from the shutter, these are your only indications that anything is going right or wrong with the DJ-1000. The top red LED lets you know if there's card activity or the battery is low, and the bottom LED flashes green, red, or some combination of the two to indicate memory card status. When you power it on, the lights all light up, and then the bottom LED turns green if it's ready to take a picture. Press the shutter, and you'll see the top LED turn red. When you're running low on memory, the bottom LED lights up green and red, then solid red for the final shot, and eventually it'll flash red when it's full. The 2 megabyte card holds 15 photos, but it supports compact flash cards up to 15 megabytes, which provides an image capacity of 113. 
Interesting to note that one of these high-capacity cards would have cost more than the camera itself back in 97 at around $260 a piece. And you really wanted a second card back then because there is no way to delete photos from the camera, so it's either swap cards or transfer your images to a computer. Once you've taken some pictures, it's time to develop them through a Windows PC, and yes, I do mean develop, since this stores images in a proprietary file format exclusive to this camera. So even though it uses a standard CF card that's readable in a modern PC, you still need the DJ1000 viewer software that it came with. Otherwise, all you'll see is a folder with a bunch of DAT files. So open up the viewer application and run the index command. It'll then read the photos, generate thumbnails, and from here you can convert them into standard bitmap images one by one. So let's take a look at them. As usual with older cameras, I enjoy taking photos of things that would have been around when it was new, in this case the late 1990s, and yeah, for that purpose this camera fits the bill wonderfully. There's something about that early consumer digital camera aesthetic that charms the pants off me no matter what. And the DJ1000 in particular has a look to it that made it really fun to play with over the past month or so. The image quality isn't too bad, although the saturation is always low and the color temperature skews to the cooler side. It also has this particular type of spotty pixelation and dithering that becomes more apparent on vivid, solid colors. Kind of looks like an early FMV game. And take a look at this comparison to my phone's camera and you get an idea of how it's affecting things. It makes it pretty exciting to take pictures and get them onto a PC so you can see what unpredictable weirdness you ended up with. Then there's the way it handles specular highlights and lighting of a certain range and brightness. Check it out! You get these green streaks protruding downward from anything bright enough, like reflecting sunlight and white or shiny surfaces. This alleyway shot in particular looks crazy. It made it look like the building in the background was casting a shadow, but it was actually just freaking out at the bright blue sky up against the dark brick walls that turned purple. And this one is probably my favorite. It was taken sideways and then rotated, and with the green trails from the reflecting light, it looks like this car was speeding by, even though it was standing still at the time. I've seen similar things on other older digital cameras without an infrared filter, but this particular style of strange on the DJ1000 is just fascinating to me. And yes, I also tried it with a UV filter. It made no difference. There are also an assortment of image adjustments you can perform through the viewer application, like color balance, contrast, and brightness. My favorite, though, is sharpness. Er, my gird, sharpness. <laughs> it's so sharp. Then there's resolution, which is a distinctly separate function from resizing. The DJ1000 shoots using a 1 5th inch Sanyo CCD that, by default, produces photos with a resolution of 320 by 240 pixels. But that's just the normal resolution. If you choose high resolution from the viewer program, it'll reopen the photo and output it at 504 by 378. That's an increase of 57%. And yeah, there's a legit difference. It's not just upscaling the image. This is a picture at normal resolution, and here's the exact same picture reprocessed in high resolution. It's still low res by today's standards, but it's notably clearer and reveals more detail, and you even end up with an ever so slightly higher field of view. There's also a bit more of that green light on the left hand side, adding one more quirk to the unique visual quality of the DJ1000. And finally, the last thing I want to mention is the fact that deleting photos is a bit weird. Like, you'd think you'd be able to just go into Windows Explorer and delete them that way, right? Nope! I learned this the hard way, but if you do that, then the camera will think the card is still full. Apparently this is due to some kind of conflict with how Windows 9X and above handles deleted files and the indexing done through the camera software. I thought I'd just be able to reformat the card and it'd be fine, but that didn't work either. It just thought the card was still full. I had to put the images back onto the card, go into the camera software and delete them from there, re-index the folder, and then it was fine. What a pain. And that is the Mitsubishi DJ1000 digital camera from 1997. A somewhat annoying little thing, but an absolutely charming one nonetheless. This is one of those situations where I adore a piece of retro tech so much precisely because it's so confined in capabilities and finicky in functionality. I really enjoy the weird, grainy, off-color images it produces, and I absolutely love how it feels in the hands. Its thin, lightweight metal construction is just a pleasure to hold, and the fact that it's an obscure digital camera from 1997 makes it all the more fun. Shame that Mitsubishi never made a successor, but oh well, at least we got the DJ1000.
And if you enjoyed this Digicam retrospective, then might I recommend a couple more? You can also subscribe for more videos every week here on LGR. And as always, I thank you very much for watching.